Coming up on Tech News Today, Google and Samsung may be getting a little closer, but the ISPs are watching you, and Boxy's trying to kill cable TV, or all they. It's all in the wrist. Well, that, wait, that's Microsoft. All that and more coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, October 9th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by MailRoute, email filtering in the cloud, companies, and resellers of any size. MailRoute offers live human support and one-click sign-up. For free postini migration and 10% off the life of your account, visit MailRoute.net, click the sign-up button, and enter the promo code TNT. And by the new Squarespace. Squarespace introduces a new content management system, making it faster and easier to create a high-quality website, blog, or online portfolio, plus more than 50 new features, including mobile responsive designs. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT10. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your iPhone, iPad, MacBook, or Android smartphones. Find out what your gadget is worth and get cash to upgrade to the latest iPhone at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zachter. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting with the top 10 stories of the day in the news views. Google may partner up with Samsung to bring out a 10.1-inch high-end tablet. According to CNET, Richard Shim at NPD Display Search has some pretty good supply chain indications that this is going to happen. The tablet would sport a 2560 by 1600 display with 299 PPI compared to iPad's 264 PPI. Shim also believes Google will start production on a $99 tablet in December. Fifth generation iPod Touch and seventh generation iPod Nanos have begun shipping with deliveries due for late this week or early next week, which does fall in line with the previous reports of an official October 9th launch date. Mako Takara has already started posting unboxing iPod Touch and iPod Nano photos, as well as system status and benchmarking tools on the new iPod Touch, which falls in line with iPhone 4S. They've got the same chip in there, so no big surprise. We've got some official pricing information on an Intel-based Windows 8 tablet. The Acer Iconia W510 will cost $500 when it becomes available hmm. on November 9th. How could it be so low-priced? Maybe it's the fact that it's using an Intel Atom Z2760 processor and 2 gigabytes of RAM. It also doesn't come with a keyboard dock. To get the dock and the tablet, you're going to have to pay $750. Still pretty attractive, but that's RT, right? No, right? this is Intel. That's 8? This is Windows oh. 8. Oh, Tempting, very tempting. Uh, lots of blogs are posting their thoughts on AMD's Z60 chip, the formal name of what you may have heard previously named Hondo. Z60 Hondo. is AMD's answer to Intel's Clover Trail. We just heard about the Z2760 and will power Windows 8 tablets sometime around the arrival of Windows 8 at the end of October, according to AMD. The Z60 has 80 Radeon graphics cores, GPU at 275 megahertz, and dual CPU cores of 1 gigahertz. Six years ago, AOL acquired Games.com from Infogrames, former parent company of Atari. The then alien Infogrames got rid of a number of assets for around $25 million, with AOL scooping up Games.com for an undisclosed figure and then making it a division of AOL. Well, today it is relaunching that with more than 5,000 free online games, mobile games, and other cool stuff for gamers. AOL obviously wants Games.com to be the portal for online gamers, and I, they have a good name. Game. At least. Games.com. Uh, the Verge published leaked photos of the Boxy TV. Now, this set-top box combines the regular Boxy experience with a tuner so you can record television on the device. That's right. It's a DVR. The Boxy TV could allow you to watch uh, your content across different devices via the Boxy app. Pricing and availability aren't known yet. Kind of a simple TV competitor. All Things D reports Twitter is considering building its own video hosting service. Uh, users could then upload videos directly to Twitter instead of using services like YFrog or TwitVid. Twitter recently moved image hosting in-house as part of an effort to provide a consistent Twitter experience. Say hello to Samsung's Galaxy Music Smartphone, an Android 4.0 device with some fancy audio and music features. Comes with dual stereo speakers in the front along with built-in FM radio. 
and features like Sound Alive, which is sort of a bass booster, tone booster, overall quality booster, and SRS, which stands for Sound Retrieval System, which adds effects to music and tries to produce 5.1 surround sound with just two speakers. GFI Labs researchers have found a new malware campaign that sends Skype users links from contacts in their address book that attempts to install a variant of the dork bot worm. Trend micro researcher Rick Ferguson reported it engages in click fraud and eventually installs software that locks the user out of the machine and asks them for $200. I really like that name, dork bot. Dork bot. It's I was going to say Ferguson. I like the name Ferguson. <laughs> the I like dork bot Ferguson. <laughs> the future is coming. A new wrist worn sensor created by Microsoft, Newcastle University, and the University of Crete called Digits would recognize hand gestures made in 3D space. The prototype uses off-the-shelf components and currently requires the device to be tethered to a PC to handle the computation. The goal is to make Digits as small as a wristwatch so you can wear it all day. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by MailRoute. I bet your company qualifies under one, if not both, of these two conditions. You either want maximum no spam or you're migrating from Postini. To another email filtering service. Either way or both, check out MailRoute.com. <clears throat> they offer live support and an easy one-click sign-up pro process. You can migrate from Postini to MailRoute today and receive email protection services free of charge for the remainder of your Postini contract. Even if you're not on Postini, though, it's worth taking a, a look at. Customer support is what they're good at. MailRoute, uh, when you, do, do, when you uh, open a service ticket, you automatically receive a call back within the hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. MailRoute is a hosted email filtering service in the cloud for businesses of any size, and they love the little guy, too. They'll even handle singer user accounts like me. Uh, there's no easier way to filter your email. You don't need any hardware or software. You just point your email to MailRoute. It's a DNS MX record edit that you make. And all that happens is your email is routed through MailRoute and back to your box. And on the way, all the spam is taken out. I've been using it. And give me some stats here. Uh, over the past 12 months, they blocked 235,000 spam messages from one of my subbrilliant.com email addresses. That's 99.7% of the mail volume, uh, blocking nearly 600,000 messages for Leo in the last 12 months. That's over 12 million messages blocked by MailRoute since Leo started using the service. Uh, MailRoute has disaster recovery service included, uh, holds mail for up to 15 days without a file limit. If the, if your server goes down, the, they're a nice backup service for you. So go check them out. Here's the offer. Try it for free. Go to MailRoute.net, click the sign up button, and enter the promo code TNT to start your 15-day trial, and you'll get 10% off the life of your account if you decide to keep it. No credit card required for the free trial. That's MailRoute.net. Click the sign-up button and enter the promo code TNT. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. All right, let's bring, bring in uh, Mark Millian uh, from Bloomberg, a technology writer for Bloomberg, and uh, you've been a guest of the show under many monikers. Uh, good to have you back, man. Yeah, good to see you, Tom. Good to see you, too. Let's start off talking about this uh, Google Nexus tablet uh, that that is rumored. Google partnering with Samsung seems likely. They've been cozying up with Samsung quite a bit uh, lately. The The big spec here that, that is in the leak is that it has this higher pixels per inch, right? Uh, that it would be a higher pixel per inch than the iPad. But I thought the iPad was retina, which meant the implication is that we can't distinguish the difference between this. So why would you need more pixels? Just so you could say you have something better than, or you can hold it closer is to it your face, right? Is it just something to put on the box? Well, the iPad, okay. theoretically, retina okay. is like at a distance of like whatever your, your arm's length, it's retina. But if you want to bring it closer, you start seeing the pixel, uh, the density. So I sure. guess theoretically, okay. hold it closer, see more pixels. Uh, are we getting a, a Google-Samsung relationship similar to Microsoft and Intel in the 90s? What do you think, Mark? I mean, these, these, these guys are, are starting to get real close, and yet Google owns Motorola. Yeah, that's, that's really the, uh, the confusing thing. They bought a hardware company that spent, you know, it was their biggest acquisition ever, and for some reason they're still cozying up to Samsung. Um, I, I don't know what that says about the state of Motorola that they, you know, either can't or aren't able to produce a tablet of the quality that Samsung can, so Google is still hanging on to this relationship they have. It's kind of a reverse situation uh, here with this rumor. We have a rumored iPad mini, which would be Apple's response to the 7-inch market, mm -hmm. saying, you know what, that Nexus 7 is pretty good, that Kindle Fire is pretty good, we need to get into that market. Here, Apple has dominated the 10-inch tablet market with the iPad, uh, and, and Google looks like they might be saying, you know what, we've did, done pretty well with the Nexus 7. Let's move into that market 
the same way. Let's partner up instead of with Asus this time. Let's partner up with Samsung. Yeah, a Nexus 10-inch device would make a lot of sense with Samsung because that they've had that relationship for the Galaxy Nexus and a couple of other devices in the past. So it wouldn't be that surprising because I would, Samsung, like, they provided the LCD panels for lots of different companies, including Apple. Samsung would probably do a better job getting these things at a lower cost than Google's own Motorola division. That's probably one of the reasons they would stick to Samsung. The other thing is Samsung knows what it's doing when it comes to this space. At least they could... Uh, Say, hey, by the way, Samsung, you know I keep getting sued over this the same kind of looks? Just put stock Android on it, and we'll be fine. So let's just do that. And We've got a pile do. of Motorola patents now. We got your back. Possibly. Yeah, uh, that, that that's true. Uh, also, this $99 tablet, uh, a cheaper Nexus. I don't know what to make of that. There's a screenshot from a Scandinavian retailer uh, also that's listing a Samsung Galaxy S3 Mini. Uh, so remember we heard that rumor that this October 11th announcement that's happening in Germany would be a mini, and we all kind of snickered, like, really? They'd come out with a, a mini phone? Uh, but it look, it look, looking more and more like it, it really might happen. Mark, what do you make of this? These Scandinavian retailers are a gold mine for leaks. <laughs> yeah. I, I, love, uh, I love those Scandinavian stores. They're a fish mine of leaks. Are there a, oh. Yeah. Well, it's... Trying to make a uh, IKEA joke should have used meatballs. I meatballs would have worked better, yeah. but I mean the thing is with the Samsung Galaxy. Herring. S <laughs> yes, oh, red herring. Thank you. Maybe it's a red you herring. Get it. I got it. Uh, but yeah, the, the S3 though is what a 4.8 inch, inch device. So like, a menu could be a 3.5 or it could be a 4.3 and still be smaller. Do than people the want that? Is that? Yeah, is it's that called the iPhone, right? They have a four-inch screen, so like I, to I have feel a smaller like the name than a four-inch. Is, it's not going to be part of this. They're saying mini just because it's convenient to say, you know, a smaller version of something that already exists. The S3 Mini. Yeah, they wouldn't, that, that would wouldn't be, be the official name, right? It would be the Samsung Galaxy S Cute. Ugh. Or portable. <laughs> right. Or some other funny word. Let's talk about scoff laws, shall we? <laughs> Want to? Yeah. All right, good. Because uh, I read <laughs> all about something? it this morning. Um, <laughs> the copyright alert system, which is also known as the Six Strikes Plan, um, is an initiative backed by our current, our, the Obama administration, us and the U.S. current administration, um, and then, you know, the bigwigs, the major uh, record labels. And this is meant to stop internet access for online copyright offenders. Um, it's in place to possibly pass by year's end and includes partic uh, participation from AT&T, Cablevision, Comcast, Time Warner Cable, Verizon. So we got the big ISPs on board. So here's what would happen as far as these st six strikes go. First offense, you as a subscriber would receive an email alert from your ISP saying, this account may have been misused for something. Just giving you a heads up. Not really even pointing any fingers, just heads up. Second offense, the alert might contain something like an educational message that would forward you to a page about, you know, what copyright infringement means, that sort of thing. So a little bit more of like a, okay, here's maybe you need to know a little bit more about how this all works. Third and fourth offense, a subscriber would likely receive some sort of a pop-up notice that asked the subscriber to acknowledge receipt of this alert. So at this point, it's like, listen, we keep telling you that something's wrong here. Now we need you to say, yeah, okay, I got it. I'm reading this. I understand. We're we're all uh, yeah, on the same page. After that fourth offense, ISPs could begin so-called mitigation measures. That means things like reducing your internet speed or redirecting uh, your service to then a landing page about infringement that you know you have to read before you can get past or you can't close it or something like that. An ISP could shut down uh, a member service altogether, but that's not actually it's not required. explicitly part of this mm, bill, correct? Optional. Copyright holders are still free to sue somebody individually, by the way. Um, but uh, the president of the digital rights group Public Knowledge, uh, Gigi Sohn, says, you know, this should have passed already um, because of SOPA and PIPA earlier this year, getting so much uh, widespread attention online. Um, we've kind of felt like there might be just some bad PR here. Uh, the, this is not the same kind of uh, 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 bill. There are differences. Is it a bill or is it just a private agreement? I thought I thought this was just a an yeah. Agreement. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, sorry. I, I shouldn't call just things checking. bills that aren't bills. Yes, you're right. Um, so yeah, so this is this is something different um, entirely. Uh, what the Copyright Act would allow is up to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars per infringement of a work registered with the Copyright Office, and this is really just going after P2P file sharing. Um, this is not the sort of thing that would go after Dropbox folders 
or email attachments or cyber lockers. This is P2P file sharing based on people's IP addresses uh, showing up. Now, of course, you can say, well, wait a second. No, an IP address does not mean a person. And that's true. Subscribers uh, can challenge uh, dings. Uh, they have to pay a $35 filing fee paid to an arbitration service. And then they get a free pass, one time only, if they claim, listen, this was because I had an unencrypted Wi-Fi network. This was not me. So the, the copyright alert system says, we understand that that happens. But if it does, you close your Wi-Fi network and then it shouldn't happen to you again. Um, Meanwhile, a Pennsylvania district court judge has ordered a copyright holder to go to trial for the first time for going after alleged file shares um, instead of settling out of court based on BitTorrent related evidence. Yeah. Now, you may have heard of other people going to court, like Jamie Thomas Rassett is the mm -hmm. most fa favorite. I'm sorry, Jamie Thomas Rassett, the most famous. But uh, I would say Jamie too. I, I know it is Jamie. Uh, this is the first time that it's been BitTorrent. Those those were That's all correct. those were all uh, things like Nutella and I can't remember any of them anymore. What Kazaa? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So so this is the first time that BitTorrent will be tested in court, and that's what this copyright alert system would be going after is is detecting people uh, on who are using BitTorrent to share files. Now I wonder how they're detecting it. Uh, is is it uh, relying on those third party systems that go into BitTorrent and share files as, as sort of a honeypot? Uh, or are they doing some sort of packet inspection, which is fraught with peril? What do you think of this whole system? Is this really all this effort, Mark? Is it is it is it going to to have an effect? Uh, well, I think the uh, the ISPs maybe shot themselves in the foot a little bit because they've been sending out these email alerts for uh, you know at least a couple of years, and people just kind of ignore them because they've always been empty threats. So. If they really are given, um, if, if the ISPs are given the ability to actually act on, um, uh, to act when they identify somebody, you know, committing a piracy act on the line, um, I don't think that's going to be completely clear to users of the internet in the U.S. that there, there are actual ramifications after you receive these alerts and after you download some pirated content. Um, I think maybe they acted a little too early, um, and and I think this uh, this copyright alert system um, they've not been fully transparent throughout this process as, they, as they've done the uh, the negotiations on this in back rooms, and so there's just a lot of uh, there's not a lot of transparency in the process, and there probably should be. I'm kind of curious about the six offenses thing. Like I, I like it seems like six times. I mean, how, how often do you make a mistake more than once? You're like, oh, six times. Seriously, you're making a mistake. But if you're downloading six things at one day, is that six offenses? Is I said, I'm trying to read through the FAQ at copyrightinformation.org, and I don't see exactly... Well, it's six alerts, right? Right, but so, can you get yeah. them all on the same day no, if somebody's doing that? No, in fact, um, it, there is at least a seven-day grace period okay. from one, you know, this is your second warning to the third. Okay, so that that I guess that six that's so six weeks of screwing up effectively mm -hmm. you're continuously doing it. I mean, I don't know if this is going to make a difference for ISPs. This is all voluntary, right? And they're all going to go ahead and do this anyway. So the question is, will it be like an ISP that's saying we're not going to comply with this? Is that where you would go? Because this this sounds like this could easily be mistaken. It's like, okay, well I didn't I didn't do this. That's not a copy. You you took the wrong file. You take you're pretending like I downloaded Tom's book, and because he, he wanted to share it with me. You have a copyright on it. What if they take that wrong? So it's a real, like, it's murky for me. Well, so and this is why it's important me. to note that it's not a bill in right. Congress. It's extrajudicial. And so you have to pay $35 to challenge your ding. Uh, and this is points up the problem with the, with, with the lack of competition, right? AT&T, Cablevision, Comcast, Time Warner, and Verizon. A lot of places, that covers all of your ISP choices. So if you are wrongly accused or this system doesn't work very well, what choice do you have? You, you have to live with the system. You can't lobby your congressperson to change it unless you lobby them to, to like, just change the law to make this kind of system illegal, which is highly unlikely. I heard Dish is getting to ISP stuff. I guess you got to go there now. Like, yeah. This is the, you have to, I'm, I might start paying attention to what ISP is not on this list. I mean, that seems like it's a potential, you know, irritation for me when I'm just doing anything. Cause on the other hand, though, if they... If they are very conservative, which the ISPs only agreed to this because they get so many ways to, to opt out of it, right? Mm -hmm. They get so many places where they can go, well, we're going to give an extra notice here, and we're not going to actually throttle them there. Uh, the ISPs don't want to annoy their customers too much. They want to mollify 
the partners that they have with their other parts of their businesses for TV and movies. And this is a compromise solution. So if they don't have a lot of false positives, I don't think a lot of people are going to pay any attention to this. It's not going to be a big deal. But I don't know that it ends up doing anything except costing a lot of people a lot of money. I don't know that it actually solves anything as far as reducing copyright infringement. I don't think it's even in the uh, the ISP's interest to... I don't think they'll be making you know a bunch of money from these arbitration cases. I think it would cost them more than thirty-five dollars to have to um, bring somebody, you know, pay somebody to go to small claims court and, and meet with these people. So, um, I, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. But the only potential upside I can see for the ISPs is one, it improves their, you know, there's two, one, it, it improves their relationship with the Hollywood studios and two, it would uh, reduce bandwidth probably from, from high bandwidth uh, piracy users. Possibly. Yeah. I, I, the one thing I do like is the education end of it, that it starts off by saying, Hey, maybe you didn't realize this is what the copyright law is because a lot of people really don't. They honestly don't. And then, and the, and Hey, maybe you didn't realize how to encrypt your Wi-Fi connection so that people aren't surfing on that part of it. I, I do think is positive. If you want to pull something positive out of it. Uh, Let's talk about watching video at home legally uh, without having to pay for cable service. Boxy's uh, new TV box that got leaked out looks pretty interesting. Boxy's TV box, something like that. Yeah, The Verge published photos of the Boxy TV. Now, to be fair, they had that original thing called the Boxy box that had a very strange shape. Uh, that's gone now. It's a traditional set-top box design, a little rectangular little device. Uh, the Verge says the device is going to include an antenna because it has a TV tuner input. Uh, it's it, there's no nobody knows if there's a a drive in there to actually record videos on there. So that's why people think it might be like simple television where you or simple TV where you can record to another external hard drive. It's hinted that the content you could share on your devices using the the app. The remote changed. It's got doesn't have a QWERTY remote anymore. But the device is not ready yet. Uh, Verge's sources say the software crashes several times a day, and Boxy plans to update it before the Boxy TV is unveiled. Well, that's probably why they haven't released it then. Well, yeah, if it's crashing it's, on yeah. a regular basis, yeah. not exactly the best product out there, especially since, I mean, right now it's a pretty tight race when it comes to, not tight race, it's a really big field when it comes to set-top boxes. There's tons of them out there. But the Boxy box having a DVR on it, like, is this something that'll pick up steam? Or is this like, oh, look, you have a TiVo-looking thing. Big deal. I, I love this idea. Something that I can get, you know, over-the-air shows, but not have to worry about being there watching live, so I could I could DVR them. That's that's one step farther than I am right now. I like this idea. Okay. You don't have cable, right, Sarah? Right. So, so that's, I, yeah, I don't have cable either. So that's, uh, that's, that's a pretty attractive thing. It, I think that it'll hugely depend on, um, you know, what the software looks like, whether it works, and you know, what the price is and what some of the features are, but... It'd also be um, nice if it worked with an existing antenna. You know, I've got a Leaf mm -hmm. antenna, which is, it's just this great OTA antenna that, that hides really well, and, you know, it's not ugly, and I don't want to get rid of that, so... Yeah, the device has a coax input, so you should be able to hook up any old antenna into it. So yeah. Q-cam or nice. yes, it does clear, clear cam? cam. Yeah, so you can sorry. do that, and you can, if you have a cable box and you want to connect it somehow, you can. But, I mean, I'm looking at this device, uh, I the problem I have with... with, with this DVR concept with Boxy, I just, I just think it's, it's almost too late for Boxy, as far as I'm concerned, because there's, it, to have a DVR that that works fine, that's great. Simple TV can do that. Media Center can do that. But you have to pay for, a, a, probably, I'm guessing this, you have to pay for the the programming guide. Mm -hmm. This is something do. that I'm thinking that this might be a little bit of a detraction for something like this. If TiVo costs about fourteen dollars a month, or they probably increase that. Simple TV, I think, is five dollars a month for the mm -hmm. program guide. Media Center doesn't charge anything. I well, don't know what Boxy's going to do. Maybe maybe Avner Ronan over there, Boxy, got a deal where the guide would be free. That would be a big advantage. The other thing is this is all built into one thing, right? Simple TV requires a Roku app mm -hmm. or another app on another device right. uh, to view it. So, so there's an advantage to Boxy there as well. Yeah, and the other thing is when it comes to DVR stuff, I'm thinking stability is incredibly important. You don't yep. want an appliance. This should be an appliance. If Boxy really wants to be you know, dead simple and they want everybody to get this device, hook up your antenna, watch all the free TV you want, and go online. This thing can't crash as nor regularly because it's a set-top box. Well, but th this is a leak, right? I think it's a little unfair to criticize him too much about that. This oh, is, I mean, Boxy didn't come out and say, here's our product, you know, and in, in, in we're ready to talk about it yet. They, so I've been using the Boxy software since it came out. That's why I'm like, I've you're been You're talking very, about the current the, release box. The software right. that came out a long time ago for PCs and Macs. I've been using that. I've tried out the Boxy box. I've been underwhelmed. 
I mean, it's a really great idea. It's, a, it's an offshoot of XBMC. I think it's really good. But it's, I just really hope it's, I hope it's fantastic when it comes out. All right, take a quick break and uh, thank our sponsors, the new Squarespace.com. They're, they're reformed. They're better than ever. Uh, faster, actually. Easier to create a high-quality website, blog, or online portfolio. Uh, they have a new content management system called Squarespace 6. Let's you focus even more on just making good content. They make it easy to use. They make a beautiful design so that you don't have to think about it. You just pick one of their customizable templates. Uh, you get in there and start writing your content. If you do run into an issue, you're like, I'm not quite sure. I, I want to do this, and I don't see how to do it. Great support, 24-7. Uh, and you can you can take advantage of that whenever you want. So so do that. Don't don't think we're kind of in the in the habit now from using all these online services of like, yeah, but you can't really get anybody on the phone because it's, you know, so I, so I'm not going to bother with it. No, use the support. Use Squarespace. They've developed new templates that are mobile ready as well. So if you look at it on a tablet, you look at it on a phone, you're actually going to see your site automatically restructured to look great on any brand, smartphone, tablet, or computer. They actually redo your images. You upload one image, looks great in your template. They resize it seven different versions, so it looks right in all the different templates. And those templates are gorgeous as well. 100% drag and drop functionality for all your customization tools. Never been a better time to try out squarespace.com. So go do it. Don't have to give them a credit card or any kind of information. There's no barrier to trying it out. You can create any kind of crazy website you want. And then if you do decide to keep it, use the offer code TNT10 and get 10% off your first purchase on new Squarespace accounts. Includes monthly and annual plans. If you sign up for the annual plan, you get a free domain registration with your annual plan subscription. That's squarespace.com. Use that offer code TNT10. And we thank Squarespace for their support of Tech News Today. <laughs> Got more stuff. Uh, AMD, uh, as we mentioned in the news fuse, uh, detailing their Z60 chip. That's the one they, that was codenamed Hondo. Uh, 80 Radeon graphics cores, uh, GPU at 275 megahertz, CPU at 1 uh, gigahertz, a dual core CPU, so both of them 1 gigahertz. Form factor is as thin as 10 millimeters. Now, how does that compare to Clover Trail? Clover Trail can do 8.5 millimeters. So it's close, but it's not quite better. Uh, tablets with Z60 are set to launch at the end of October, but they have nobody on board that they're talking about. And Intel has 20 partners named already. So they're a little behind there. But there are some positives here. AMD claims the Z60 system can play Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 at 1024 by 768 at 30 frames per second. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, they also took the tactic of taking their laptop chip, their low-end laptop chip Ontario, and just making it more power efficient. So this is going the other direction from Clover Trail, which is a beefed-up Medfield processor. And they... Uh, they're trying to say that they'll have better battery life. I'm not sure that that's true. Clover Trail uh, claims uh, three weeks of standby, uh, and AMD is only claiming two weeks of standby. And then there's all kinds of different ways of slicing and dicing it. We'll have to wait till somebody gets some benchmarks on this and actually find out what it does in real day use. But AMD's saying, "Ah, you can you can work all day without recharging the battery." We'll see if that's true. Uh, Anybody excited about AMD? It seems like they could compete on price. They always do. And they've definitely got an advantage here on graphics, it looks like. AMD is in that weird space between ARM and Intel with the, with the pricing. That's the thing. So, like, they, they should theoretically be able to have a lower-cost Windows 8 desktop experience on a tablet if you wanted it, where, whereas ARM couldn't do that. I mean, AMD's big pull has been the graphics when it comes to this. And if they can – they're saying you can run Call of Duty on this. If you can push the gaming aspect of the tablet – that's what they should be doing. So I, I'm excited that there's competition in that field because then you're going to have different pricing. Although as a consumer, I could see being confused as you know, as, as, like you wouldn't believe because there's Windows RT, there's the AMD version of Windows 8, there's the Intel version of Windows 8, and they'll have pretty similar pricing because if that Acer Iconia is Well, only, when you say version, it's the same Windows 8. Right, it's Windows... Just, right, it's right. just running. It's different Windows RT is, Windows, Windows RT is actually a different Windows, version. I'm, of I'm different versions of the tablet. Like, there'll be different yeah, tablets yeah. out there. And that kind of confusion, I don't know how great that's going to be in the marketplace when it's like, which one do you get? No, there's not much confusion in desktop marketplace. Do you think there'd be... Tablet space? I think tablet space might be more confusing. Than because that. of the processor, though? Pricing. I think the pricing mm -hmm. will be. I think the AMD pricing will be closer to the RT pricing. But you'll get a full Windows 8. I think that's a big advantage. And that's the confusion aspect. Like, why uh, would I get this one over the other one? Because I don't know which one is which. Yeah. It's got armor AMD. What does that mean? <laughs> You're like, I don't trust you. You're giving me this not <laughs> <laughs> Are a lot of people wanting to play something like Call of Duty on a tablet, or is that just an easy way to say, look how powerful this tablet is? I think it's more the second. Yeah, because I mean, I, I know on on iPad today we're 
we look at games and sometimes we're like, eh, this is kind of a ridiculous game to play on a tablet, but here it is. So, I'm kind of curious what Mark thinks about this because I'm thinking, you know, the hybrid, the hybrid style laptops that exist now. You take you know, it's a tablet and then you dock it. It acts like a desk, like a regular laptop. People game on regular laptops, right? Is this something, Mark, you'd be thinking about when it comes to hybrids? Uh, I'm not not much of a gamer um, on PCs or tablets or anything like that. But I know a lot of people uh, who are, and I know, uh, you know, especially on iPad, those high end games like the. Uh, What's what's the the epic game that they've got a sequel to already with like the sword fights and and hammer fights and stuff that that game is huge they sell a ton of copies of that uh, and so I wouldn't discount gaming on a tablet um, and as for you know AMD versus Intel I think if AMD can actually sign on partners and undercut Intel on price then you know the consumer is going to go into the store they'll talk to the salesperson the options will be. Here's the stripped down tablet, long battery life. Um, it can do fewer functions, but it has all the tablety stuff. That's RT, and it's cheaper. Or, you know, you have this group of tablets that's a little more expensive, but it can do Microsoft Office, and you can get your start menu on the bottom. And if the AMD tablets are the cheapest, I don't think people are really gonna, you know, know one way or the other. Now, the big um, X factor will be whether AMD can sign on big partners like Sony and, you know, companies with the the big name brands and laptops that people, you know, lean toward if they're going for a, a higher price experience. Yeah, again, as as with all of these AMD releases recently, they're good releases. Uh, they have lots of positives. We, if you're looking for something that's going to bring AMD back on top, though. You're not finding anything that is obviously going to push them right back into the front. But that's not to criticize them or damn them with faint praise. I, I think AMD's coming out with some good stuff. And, and, and a cheap Windows 8, full Windows 8 tablet that runs one of these processors, if the battery life isn't bad, is pretty attractive. Call me a cab, Sarah. Oh, wait, I don't have any cash. Oh, that's okay. Uh, do you have a Square account? I do, yeah. Do I you love, have money in the bank that your Square account is attached yeah, to? Yeah, I do. I, I use it all the time and for then coffee. Then you can get that cab. I don't trust. You know, I don't trust it. I've I've gone into cabs, and I try <laughs> to pay with a Visa, and they're like, oh, I know I have a Visa sign, but I really, I don't, I'd rather take cash. No, but that's the thing about the Square situation is that if as long as they have the Square infrastructure inside the cabs, then it really shouldn't matter. Um, we're actually talking about Square possibly coming to New York City cabs and limos. Um, New York City. Yeah, private company expert Privco. I think that's how you say it. Privco or Privco. I love that. So Privco is not the TLC or Square says, hey, they're in talks, those two. Um, they're going to be announcing an official partnership uh, to implement Square's payment systems across all city cabs. Um, they're in, negoti in negotiations. So as long as those, ne those negotiations go as expected, the partnership may be announced as early as this month or at least by the end. Now, Square says, we've got a positive production relationship with New York City's Taxi and Limousine Commission, but no basis in fact as far as Privco's report. But, I mean, there is, f there is some fact uh, because since March... It's facty. Square, it's, it's a little facty. Square has been um, testing out a new technology uh, program in place with New York's TLC. Um, featured iPads connected to credit card swipers in um, a, a, a small number of cabs that were being tested. Jack Dorsey, CEO of Square, recently tweeted out, in a Square cab with Mayor Bloomberg. Mm. You know, so I mean, it's... it's and he it's, met a cab that he paid for with Square, not just the shape of the cab. Right, yes, because that would be a weirdly shaped cab. Yeah, so it's, it's you know, th there's there's hints that this relationship um, is, is getting to a point where uh, consumers could take advantage of the Square technology in all cabs, uh, which would be huge, of course. I mean, New York City has over 13,000 cabs in active operation right now. Um, if 1,000 cabs uh, get Square's uh, iPad card readers over the next year, Privco says that's about an upfront cost of about a million dollars to Square, but it could reap Square the rewards of up to $15 million annually. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, this is fresh off the heels of Square's partnership with Starbucks uh, to use uh, the Square Square technology on the back end for at least 7,000 of Starbucks stores in the yeah, U.S. Yeah. to start. With tipping and stuff coming next year, I'm not really sure why they can't just yeah. tip up. 
at the beginning. Someone on Twitter pointed out that one of the reasons that Starbucks may not be allowed tipping, because the Square app does allow tipping, I yes. use it at the Acre Coffee Shop, I do too. Uh, is that Starbucks may not have figured out how to divide up the tips yet. Because if you know, Star Starbucks doesn't have tip jars. Oh. So it may be a Starbucks employee relations issue, which uh, I just okay. thought that was interesting. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's maybe. cabs, they're going to be like, yeah, yeah, put that tip sure, thing sure. in place and maybe it's right now. And maybe it's as simple as that. I, I I think this is a good, obviously a great thing for Square if, if, if it actually does roll out as we expect. Uh, I want it to come to places where I am. Mark, you used to live in New York City. Uh, would you see this becoming something that would make your life easier? Yeah, I can definitely see the advantages to it. Um, uh, the New York City taxi system is miles and miles ahead of San Francisco. So in terms of getting Literally. into a cab and they try to try to fight you on on taking a credit card, I, I don't think I've ever had that in New York. Um, it's just, you know, built into every yellow cab there. Um, I have in San Francisco here... Um, gotten into cabs and a few times, you know, the rare times I'm able to get a cab. Um, the, I'll, I'll see the cab driver will use Square instead of the credit card terminal that his company has installed. He just says it's easier. Uh, the tack, the, um, the, uh, the fees are better. Uh, so there's definitely some like bottom up uh, uptake in San Francisco for Square. New York is a little different. Uh, they're more heavily regulated. It's a harder market to break into. Um, at, as I think you talked about it on a previous show, Uber has been getting shut out of, uh, of New York's cab scene um, because of, you know, little rules about um, deals with credit card processors and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I think it'll be partnership to be had there with Square and Uber. That would be interesting. I, I wouldn't mind. Uh, although uh, Uber's got, you know, kind of the, the advantage of you don't even have to pull out. A credit card or say your name or anything you just yeah book it in the app and, and step out and you're gone um but but for the taxi situation you know i think uh the the cab companies are still very skeptical about uber whereas square i think has maybe a, a better pitch and is a little more trusted you know last night just before we move on went to my favorite ice cream store which was one of the very first square partners smitten ice cream so we went to you know Open up my Square Square Wallet app. It's now called Square Wallet. Ready to pay. And the the woman behind the counter says, oh, we don't use Square anymore. Uh. And I said, why? I've never heard of that. And you were one of the first. And she said, our official stance is we could either continue using Square or we could scale our business. I said, oh, what does that mean? Dang. And she didn't really know or <laughs> she didn't want to elaborate. That's what they wrote down for me to say. It was 9 yeah. p.m. Yeah. I wanted some pumpkin ice cream. That was the end of that. But I thought, well, that's interesting. I hadn't mm. heard that before. So not everybody's happy really with Square. Good. The one in Hayes Valley, right? Yeah, it's like yeah. a like a science experiment when you go in there. They've got like spinning Ni machine. Nitrous oh. ice cream. I love it. Yeah. I, you know, our, uh, the place where I take my dogs, uh, to, to board and stuff, they, they don't use square. They've looked at it because mm -hmm. they're like, eh, it just, it costs us more money than we pay now. So mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're definitely, square is definitely not winning on cost savings with all small businesses. Right. Yeah. Uh, finally, Microsoft wants to track my, you're on the wrist beat. You're talking about That's watches right. earlier. What's this about? Yeah, yesterday I was doing the Lark Life today. I'm talking about digits because I'm, I'm, I'm the wrist expert this week. Uh, so here's the deal. All in the we, wrist. We talked about, uh, talk about this in the news news. Digits is a wrist worn gloveless sensor that tracks your hand motions. Okay. And it's been created by researchers from Microsoft, Newcastle and, and Greece's foundation for research and technology. And this is, it's, Pretty conceptual. Uh, digits would be fully contained on the wrist. It uses an array of IR sensors on the wrist and an inertial measurement unit. And right now, like I said, it's got it's got to be tethered to a PC to handle the calculations. But the thing is, it can recognize gestures even when you're moving around. Wirelessly tethered, right? Uh, right. <laughs> That's no? the thing. Uh, okay. It wasn't clear in the articles whether it was it was physically tethered or not. Uh, possible interactions, it's shown to work while seated to play games, obviously. But in-air pinch and zoom, you could use it in conjunction with touch. You could select something and then manipulate it in the air. Eyes-free interactions, so like if you're messing with your smartphone, you could change the uh, the volume or things like that. And, and the researchers' goals are to make this the size of a wristwatch, so you can wear it all the time. Now, does this look like an awesome future or some kind of gimmick because, I mean, like, we're seeing so many different ways to interact with computers. I mean, we've seen things like uh, just, you know, we have pinch and zoom, and we have gestures, and we have things like the connect that, and, and leap, where you can see what you're doing. 
But would you wear a device like this that lets you manipulate things uh, regularly? I mean, the video that we're watching, when you're holding a tablet in your hand, and <laughs> instead of just touching the tablet, you're hovering over it slightly and making funny gestures with your fingers, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. If you're standing back and you're standing up and you're playing a first-person shooter game and you can, you know, uh, make the, I don't know, make the gun go with yeah. your hand, that's <laughs> cooler to shoot. me. Yeah, shoot. That was the verb I was looking for. Gosh, the gun goes, <laughs> Make the gun go. Make it do the thing. Or the presentation. If you're a present doing a presentation ah. and you want to, like, change slides and stuff, you just right. motion for that to happen. I can see that being pretty pretty handy on a, on a big screen. Handy. Get it? But see, what, what I'm seeing with this is the fact that like, things like the Kinect, right? The Kinect <laughs> needs like six feet. You need to be far away from this device to get to get any usage of it. And if you had one on each hand and effectively look like Spider-Man, I'd imagine, with two shooters. But the thing is, you'd, you'd be able to manipulate so many different things, especially the TV. That's really where I'm seeing this. Because when you have that line of sight issue when it comes to the Kinect, you won't have that here. You don't have to, you're not screaming at a device either, like, play next song. Play next song. Like, you know how many times I've screamed? Play next, next song, right. Xbox! If you could flick without having to be near it, uh, yeah, or used in conjunction with the Connect. I mean, the Connect is good for measuring body movements, but not for you know the nuances in how you move your your fingers and your wrists and stuff. I think but the thing I don't understand about Microsoft is why are they showing us this now and not in like five years when it's a part of the Xbox 1080 or whatever. I mean, I don't I don't get why they their research arm is just like, look at this cool thing we're not really done with, but look, imagine how cool it would be. Like, why don't you do something with this? Mark, I think that, I think Microsoft likes to tease us, like the courier. It's like, hey, look at this, never happening. <laughs> or it's that a kid, really cool. video where they're driving and there's like buildings with text overlays and emails on them. It's, I, I they, prefer this, actually, to the concept videos and the the bad actors sitting at their coffee tables. This is like, hey, we're in the labs. We're actually doing stuff. You, you think of Google when you think of labs now a lot of times, that they're self-driving cars. This is Microsoft saying, hey, we're developing crazy cool stuff, too. Uh, so I, I, I could sort of see where they're changing their tactic a little, maybe. And this thing where it has to be tethered to a PC. I mean, smartphones are getting faster and faster and faster and more powerful. At some point, you could probably get away with just having this with a phone. Yeah. Similar to how the Google Glass works with a phone. So I'm thinking this could be closer to reality, and I'm excited about it. Make it wristwatch size, and, and I'm I'm probably in. I like this. It's for, for, for certain things. I still We still need haptic feedback for some gameplay, but I like it. Let's move on to the randomizer. Randomizer. Quick randomizer today. New Zealand issuing Hobbit money. Now, this doesn't mean that it's money that only Hobbits can use. Uh, it's, it's actually coins uh, that have, like, the Hobbit pictures on them a uh, golden set of three new zealand ten dollar coins bearing the images of gandalf thorn oak and shield and the young bilbo baggins uh the ten dollar coins however will cost you eleven thousand dollars new zealand so what? you get thirty dollars worth of coins for eleven thousand dollars it's i want to talk about the silicon valley reality show for the randomizer and i got booted for this Hobbit money? Hobbit money. Well, I mean, there are people in New Zealand working on the Hobbit right now that can be paid in one or two coins. It's really efficient, <laughs> I think. I don't want to say anything. You know, my mom told me if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. That's why I don't want to talk about the Silicon Valley reality show. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Do you have anything nice to say about the Silicon Valley reality show, no. Mark? Oh. Um, I, I grew up in New Jersey, so I know what reality shows can do to the <laughs> reputation of a place. <laughs> you, you feel that pain all too closely, huh? All right, real All quickly, well. uh, thank our last sponsor, gazelle.com. You want that new iPhone? Uh, before you get the new one, make sure that you can get some cash for your old one to help you ease the pain of the cost of an upgrade. Gazelle is simple and fast. You go to G A Z E L L E.com. Tell Gazelle the condition. Be honest, because even if it's broken, they'll give you some cash. Uh, get a risk-free offer for your gadgets. Lock that in for 30 days. Then go buy your new phone. Don't send them the old one yet. You can keep using the old one because they lock it in for 30 days. Your quote stays high because you get it now. You don't wait because the offers don't get bigger. They get smaller over time. And then once you get the new phone, you can pack up the old phone. They give you a shipping label. Send it off to them for free. And as soon as they get it, they'll send you some emails saying, hey, we got it. You'll get paid by PayPal or check. Go to gazelle.com now. Get an offer for your iPhone. Do it today because your iPhone may lose value every day that you wait. With Gazelle, you get paid in cash. You get paid fast. And there's no hassle. You don't have to worry about contacting people or phoning or making appointments. You just click. You get the offer. You put it in a box. You send it off. And you get paid fast. 
fast. Go to gazelle.com, sell your used iPhone. That's how I sold mine. Uh, I got some money in my PayPal account right now, thanks to gazelle.com, and we appreciate their support of Tech News today. What's on the calendar, Sarah? Glad you asked, Tom. Firefox 16 is out now. One of these days you're going to be like, sorry you asked, Tom. <laughs> yeah, you know, Tom, it's sad state of affairs. No, this is a great calendar. So you got Firefox 16 today. Uh, the CTIA Enterprise starts tomorrow. Uh, it's in San Diego, California. It runs through Friday the 12th. The ITU, which is the International Telecommunications Union, is holding patent licensing talks in Geneva tomorrow. That's October 10th. And invites have gone out from Microsoft's UK Windows Phone 8 event. It's going to get a big reveal, so says the company, on October 29th. Got a lot of people uh, in Twitter and on the chat room telling me that their Starbucks have have tip jars. I never see tip jars in Starbucks. I've never noticed. Yeah. Actually, maybe they hide them from uh, you, Tom. Maybe I've, the service just has never been it. good enough for you to look for it. <laughs> <laughs> At the, I don't know. I'm just asking. Well, yeah. Let's I'm just what, a very stingy person. Let's I guess. see what's incoming. Incoming message. Uh, starting with Ron in Green Bay, who says, I wanted to let you know a few days ago I received a Blockbuster mailer. The basic offer was for one DVD, console game, or Blu ray disc for at one at a time for $9.99 a month. $9.99. I searched for the games listed on the mailer, uh, and none were available yet. The earliest available was in January, but most weren't available until March. Most movies were available now, but despite this, it has me considering leaving Netflix again and at least trying out the plan for a free month. So, hey, they're Blockbuster, you got another customer, possibly. Yeah, yeah. as you're going out of business in the DVD mailers and the streaming, so long. Got another email from Ryan who says, On Monday's show, you said the Tesla Museum fundraising was done on Kickstarter. However, the fundraising was actually done on Indiegogo. I just thought I'd point that out. Good, good. You know, I, I, I feel like next. Oh, my gosh. I was just about to say that. It, it's the Q-tip of fundraising it's services. Generous side. Yeah, because I, I knew Inman had used Indiegogo, and I try not to always say Kickstarter because there's lots of different services. So That's true. Ryan, thank, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you for Keeping us that. honest. Uh, and thank you all for uh, submitting stories in our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com is the place to go to let us know what stories you might think we'd be interested in including in the show. I like today that people were putting, hey, Sarah, for the calendar, look at this. Hey, Iaz, uh, you might be interested in this story. <laughs> like, it's, it's yeah, pretty it's interesting. Great. It's good stuff. Uh, so check it out, technewstoday.reddit.com. Matt Millian, thank you for joining us. Uh, tell folks where they can find your work and what you're up to. You got any uh, any good features or stories coming up you want to tell them about? Um, let's see. Not too sure. Check out uh, bloomberg.com slash tech um, for all our good stuff. There's a nice viral video out this morning that one of my colleagues wrote about um, featuring Jack Dorsey, um, Evan, or uh, Biz Stone, a bunch of, bunch of guys. It's a pretty cool video. Cool. And, of course, markmillion.com is uh, is your website. We can find all your stuff, right? Yep. All right. Thanks, man. Good to have you along, and good to have all of you in the audience along as well. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, tnt at twit.tv, and give us a call. Leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. We've got Ewan Rankin from British Tech Mac joining us tomorrow. See you then.